gracias. Uh, Union, which is a trade union in the United Kingdom, uh, which represents academic staff and researchers in universities and colleges. Uh, I'm also involved with Education International, which is our global union federation of 33 million teachers worldwide um, in trade unions. And um, as introduction uh, but I do want to talk about what Paris means in terms of education and research. Uh, I also want to talk about other international uh, frameworks which will influence the future of education on sustainable development and I also want to talk about what's happening in the UK at the moment including some of the initiatives that we're taking at local level. Um, so I hope that, uh, that is what you want to hear because that's what you're going to get. Um, I suppose I could start by saying uh, why should trade unions be interested in this topic? Uh, well, the first thing to say is that uh, if the Paris Agreement is going to deliver the kind of changes that are needed in order to bring about a zero carbon future, then it will involve a massive change in the way that the economy and society is organized. And that will in turn have massive implications on the way that work is organized and how workers go about their work. So that's why it's important for workers worldwide and it's particularly important for education workers because it's our members who will have to ensure of the duty, as you can see I've put it in bold there, is that governments shall cooperate uh, with these measures. Now that's important because um, for any of you following the Paris talks, you may know that there is a lot of what you could call horse trading. I'm not sure what the Spanish for that, that is, but hopefully it translates. In, in other words, negotiations take place about what to put in, what to take out. And some of the things were put after a lot of negotiation into the operational parts of the Paris text and other things were put into preambles and annexes where 
the standard is not so good. And also the choice of words. So there are different standards of words. So the fact that this is a, a clear duty is, we feel, very important. Um, what does it say on research? Well, research is referenced. Unfortunately, you'll see, again, from the, uh, the, uh, the word should, that it's not such a strong duty as for education. But it's still in there, and we feel that is important. Because it's clear to us, as an organisation that uh, uh, um, represents research workers, that research is going to be absolutely crucial if we're going to achieve the low carbon transition that, uh, that is needed. Uh, we heard this morning from the three students from Barcelona who came forward with their proposal that's going to be launched next week uh, on, um, called BIO. Uh, and, you know, a very good example of how something could be researched and then look at funding it to put it out there as an important product. So that sort of thing needs to be reproduced a thousandfold if we're going to stand any chance of actually achieving the below two degree centigrade target that Paris um, represented. I don't want to spend very long on this because uh, you have someone called Jan Gustaf um, speaking later uh, on the issue of the Sustainable Development Goals. But because they do actually refer to education and climate change, um, I thought I should at least highlight another example of an international framework which supports governments and local authorities uh, in their endeavours to actually combat climate change. And Goal 14 and Goal 13 do actually um, have a relevance here. Uh, as you can see, there is a target that governments will ensure that in the next 14 years, all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. And also related to that, um, the, the goal, uh, the target on, uh, on climate change. The third and final international agreement, a framework that I wanted to, uh, to talk about, was the UNESCO Global Action Programme. Uh, because that is meant to provide the Education for Sustainable Development framework for implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. And the last slide, this isn't the last slide, but uh, on the last slide, I return to these five um, target areas because I think it would be important perhaps to reflect on how you think these five targets can be implemented in Gran Canaria. Um, I won't go through them now, but they're there for you and perhaps we'll return to those. The only one I will mention, because it particularly affects our trade union, is that uh, we are, or Education International, is one of the focus group partners on the third one, which is about building the capacities of educators and trainers. In other words, it's no good expecting uh, educators to just implement education for sustainable development unless they've had the support and the training to be able to do it. And in some countries this is provided, but it's very uneven and it doesn't exist in, uh, in large numbers of places. That's really important for us because we have real issues for the terms and conditions of our members who as teachers are expected to take on new targets, new responsibilities, with no time to prepare properly, and it's a terms and conditions of employment issue. That's why this week there was some research that came out in my country, in the UK, which said that 80% of teachers in the UK are thinking of leaving the profession. And the reason why they're thinking of leaving the profession is because the demands of the job are now so great 
that it's actually becoming a very difficult industry or sector to, uh, to work in. The research also showed that a third of teachers were being asked to deliver lessons and skills that they'd had no training or support in. So again, it's no good governments coming along to the teaching profession and saying, we want you to talk about sustainable development, we want you to actually develop the skills that are needed for a, the transition to a low carbon economy without giving teachers the time and the space and the support in order to be able to deliver it. But that's quite often what is happening and it's not acceptable from a trade union point of view and it's not acceptable in terms of the conditions of, uh, of our members. So finally, on international policy, uh, how do we assess it? Well, I said that we had real concerns about the Paris Agreement and the lack of ambition. One of our big concerns, and it's also been touched on in today's sessions, is the problem of actually implementing a program like this in a period of austerity when you're talking about huge public spending cuts and affecting the ability of public sector organisations like education to be able to deliver the targets and the objectives of these UN commitments. Another area where we felt um, that we, we had a real problem with was at Paris was the fact that the references to a just transition were not put into the operational text, but were put into a preamble, which doesn't have the same force, potential legal force, as if it's in the, the text. What I mean by just transition is that there are gonna be winners and losers in the transition to a low carbon economy. That some industries are going to disappear as we've seen with the coal industry increasingly, and others are gonna be seriously affected by changes. Now, you can do that in a way which ignores the workforce and just sees them as dispensable. Or you can do it in a just way, which offers decent work for people who have to be relocated out of one sector, one industry to another. Let me give you a good example of a very unjust transition uh, in the UK where the coal miners um, had their industry closed down and workers lost their job, whole communities were destroyed and there was no alternatives put in place. Our view is that you have to ensure that where you do get people affected by a change in your industrial strategy, you have to ensure that they get decent retraining, that they get long-term career prospects, uh, and that there is um, a proper social protection net put in place for those who can't be re-employed. If you don't do that, then you understandably not gonna get the support of the workers in those industries whose livelihoods and standard of living is going to be affected. Just finally, if you do want to um, see the advice that the trade union movement is, is giving on this, Education International is in the process of preparing a set of guidelines for our affiliates on the Paris talks and the other UN agreements uh, to try and help support our affiliates in how they implement um, these programs. Okay, so that's the, uh, the international context. Just want to cover now um, very quickly some uh, information from, from the UK. Some of it's good, some of it's not so good. Uh, in terms of UK national policy, uh, we do actually, we were the first country to actually have a law which set clear targets on um, greenhouse gas emissions, and it was called the Climate Change Act of 2008. 
And in that act, uh, we have committed to reduce um, greenhouse gases by 50% um, by 2030 and 80% by 2050. Now, that ambition is going to have to be reassessed uh, in the light of Paris, because basically the research is telling us that we have to be looking at a zero carbon world in the second half of this century. And so we have to move much more rapidly beyond an 80% reduction um, around the time of 2050 if we are going to stand any chance of achieving the 2 degree centigrade increase, never mind the 1.5, uh, which Paris also referred to. Another good thing about the UK is that we have a system of carbon budgets, which are basically a five-year plan, and the, the, the next one for 2025 and 2030 is currently being negotiated about how uh, that will be financed in order to deliver the emissions that uh, are required. And then finally, we have um, already made a commitment that we will implement the, uh, the Paris Agreement. So that's all positive, but we have to be realistic and we realize that uh, in the real world, um, we've got real challenges and problems. Uh, that we are in the middle of an austerity program in the UK, and that is seriously reducing the capacity of um, local governments and other important organisations to actually deliver the kind of reductions that, uh, that are needed. We also have an industrial strategy which is what you could call, well, I think you have to describe it as incoherent, um, in as much as there is no real link-up between what we're saying in the Climate Change Act and what's happening um, within our industrial program. Um, you may know that our steel industry is at the point of collapse um, and we've basically lost the manufacturing base that we used to have. So that although we are saying we're well on target for our, our reductions, our climate reductions in terms of greenhouse gases, the reality is that we're actually importing manufactured goods from countries like China and elsewhere, and it's adding to their emissions, but the products are coming to us, so it's the whole carbon leakage problem. The third one, perhaps, worth commenting on, um, because it's a very current political debate in the UK, is the membership of the European Union, uh, where we have a, a referendum taking place in June over whether we continue to stay in the EU. Uh, this is going to be certainly a problem in terms of our environmental standards because the fact is that most of our environmental regulation and law comes from Europe and it's something that if it, that um, was taken away from us could leave us with, with serious problems. We have, for example, very poor air quality in the, uh, in the UK. And our only resort to try and get government to act seriously on air quality has been to use the European rulings and our Supreme Court to show that the UK is not complying with EU directives. Without those, we would have real problems actually holding our government to account in terms of air quality standards. Okay, uh, just to say a little bit about um, what my union is doing, We're, we have a policy of um, appointing environment reps in every branch workplace of the union, uh, and this isn't supported by law, so it means that um, these workers have no legal rights, but because many of our members see this as an important issue, we do have a big network of representatives who are prepared to take this forward and at their institution, uh, whether it's a college or a university, argue uh, that the university should be supporting um, 
various standards around both the curriculum, around the environmental management of the institution, and linking up effectively with communities, uh, doing effective community engagement. And we support these members through various resources uh, that are all available on our website, which if you want to look at them, um, are um, available, um, the newsletters, the handbooks, and, um, and the videos, and this sort of thing. I've mentioned Education International. We're also members of something called Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. Uh, that's an international organization of unions, and that's basically campaigning around the idea that the kind of energy transition that's going to be needed in order to meet zero carbon in the second half of the 21st century is something which is going to require social ownership and public control. Um, so that's something that uh, we're campaigning for both nationally and at an international level. And then finally, we've set something up called the Greener Jobs Alliance, which is bringing together a coalition of students and non-governmental organisations like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. We felt that was important because in the past, trade unions have had a bad name, I suppose you could say, that um, they've been seen as being more interested in jobs and not interested in the environment. Uh, and of course, trade unions have said that the environmental organisations are just interested in the environment and they're not interested in workers' livelihoods and jobs. We think that's a false divide, that we have to be interested in both. That it must be protecting the environment but not at the expense of decent jobs. Um, and of course, we have to recognize that if you look at many of the new industries, particularly the renewable sector, a lot of those jobs are actually non-union, they're short-term contracts, they're very poor holidays and conditions of service and very poor rates of pay. So there is a job to work to be done there if we're actually going to ensure